Welcome to Table for Two. This week we're reviewing a game called San Juan by Rio Grande Games. And we're doing it here in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Table for two, table for two. Having fun playing games, just me and you. Welcome to Table for Two. Jane and I are back in the studio to review the game San Juan and enjoy some Puerto Rican rum. And Coke. And Coke. And Coke. Mm -hmm. If it was just rum, I'd be on the floor. Mm -hmm. So, the game of San Juan. This game is produced by Rio Grande Games. Now, unfortunately, we found out that it is no longer being published. Oh. I know but we were actually thinking it was still worth to review because you can still buy this game online, you know, maybe eBay or something, but also check with your local game shop because they still may have copies on hand. So I definitely think it's a good, a good game to try to go get. This game is for two to four players, mm -hmm. ages 10 and up. Yeah. As you know, we review our games based on five criteria. One, is it easy to learn? Mm -hmm. Two, manufacturing. Three, did we have fun? Four, the length of gameplay, and five, would we play this game again? Now, it could be fun if you have rum while you're playing the game, <laughs> regardless of how bad or good the yes. game is. I'll just make sure I say mm -hmm. that. <laughs> so Jane is now going to describe the game. Yeah, I'll give you a little uh, description of how to play. So let's take a look. To set up this game, it's actually quite easy. Number one, you have a draw pile. And these are basically the San Juan draw deck is a bunch of buildings, which we'll explain here in a minute, just different buildings that you can uh, pick up. Once you put your draw pile down, you then put down five roll cards. Now each roll is a little bit different. Builder, producer, trader, counselor, and prospector. And I'll explain the, how those all work here just in a minute. So you put those five down on the table, and then you put down what's called trading house tiles. And those are hidden right now. We'll explain what those are for in just a little bit, too. So you set that up. Pretty simple setup. Each player receives four cards in their hand to start. And you also receive one building to start with. In this case, we are starting with the indigo plant. Each of us get the same exact card. Uh, so we both start with that. And then you decide who is going to take their turn first. And I've decided, because I'm the female, that I will go first. We've had this, We've had this We've conversation, had this conversation before. before. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to go first. Anyway. It's all about having a good marriage. Right? Yeah, it's all about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then what that person gets is what's called the governor card. So this card actually goes back and forth between the two of us, depending on whose turn it is. So basically, it's whose turn it is card. That's basically what that uh, stands for. Mm -hmm. So the goal of this game, guess what the goal is? Just like almost every game we play. Victory. Victory points. <laughs> Whoever has the most points wins the game. But you say, hmm, Jane, how do I get victory points? Hmm, Jane, how do I get victory points? <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> Each building card you'll see here at the bottom has a victory point or points. And this one, uh, the indigo plant, has one victory point. So that would be one point. So we actually both start with one victory point or one ahead already. Mm -hmm. um, but as you gain more buildings and you produce more goods, which we'll explain here in a minute, you gather victory points. So it's pretty much how you get them, by, by, by selling and buying and building and having a good time doing all those things. Mm -hmm. So how do you play? Well, like I said, each person gets a hand of four to start with. Now, on each player's turn, you can pick one of the roles to play. Now, if there are four people playing this game, on your turn, you can just pick one role to play during your turn. But if there's only two, Philip, what happens? Uh, if there's only two, then you get to play two roles. Two roles per turn. Per turn. So that's kind of cool. Yes. So it gives you two options to do something per turn. Mm -hmm. Now, each role has a set of actions to it. So let's say because I am the governor right now and I am the first player, I would take my first turn. So just let's take a look at the cards and see what my options are here. The first one is builder. Okay, so this one gives you an action that you can actually build a building. Now, that's what I said earlier, all these cards are buildings of some sort or another. So if I look at my hand, I'll see here that I have the coffee roaster building, and maybe that's the card I want to play. 
Now, in order to play this card, I need at least four cards in my hand to spend. So your cards almost act like money here. So I would have to have four cards. Well, I only have three, but guess what? Because it is my turn, every time somebody has their own turn in play, there is a privilege for the person taking the turn. And you'll see here it says the builder plays one less card. So in reality, this four turns into a three, and my three cards in my hand can actually buy me this card. Now let me mention why I'm talking about the privilege. During my turn, if I choose to play the builder card, after I build my building, everybody else who's playing, in this case just Philip, gets to also build a building. But he can only, when he builds his building, he has to pay full price. Right. Okay, so that's, that's the big difference there of having a privilege when it's your turn. So again, the first thing I can do is I can build a building. In this case, let's just say I built the coffee roaster and I place my cards down in the discard pile. I'm gonna keep these in my hand for right now for explanation purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, Philip may have something in his card. He, he, might, he might want to build another indigo plant or something. That's true. There is a little strategy here that I could build a, for instance, this tobacco storage, which costs three. Mm -hmm. So I would spend these three cards. I would have no cards left in my hand which could be a disadvantage later. So I might only want to build the indigo plant or this trading post for two. So might we'll just, talk about a little bit more about how that uh, works. Right. So, so what's important to understand about San Juan, which is different than a lot of games out there, is if I did build this coffee roaster and I put my three cards in the discard pile, I don't draw back up my hand. That's what's important. You lose those cards and you have no cards at that point. There are ways to get cards, which I'll explain here just in a minute, but you never draw up your hand. That's a little bit different than some games that are out there. Now the second role, and again, remember I could do two on my turn, but let's just say right now, the producer, the producer allows you to produce a good. So again, I have a coffee roaster and I have an indigo plant where I can produce goods. So on my turn, I could say, okay, I wanna do production and I can actually produce a good on one of my plants. However, because it's my turn again, the privilege of this card is I can actually do two goods. So I can actually produce on the coffee roaster and I can produce on the indigo plant. Now, how do you produce? Very simple. You take the top draw card off the pile and you place it in your plants. You don't look at the card, you just place it. It's almost an indicator that there is a good on each one of my buildings. You can only have one good per building at any given time. So I've just decided to do that. Now, Philip only has one plant anyway. Right. He can then do the same thing and produce one good onto his plant um, as well. So that's pretty simple. Right. But again, he can only do one, even if he has two buildings, because I had the privilege. Okay, so producing goods. Now, normally that would be the end of my turn, and then I would give the card over to Phil, and he would take his turn. But let's just go through the rest of the cards. Trader allows you to actually sell your goods. Right, so that's the whole point here, is to make some uh, money, per se, uh, so you can build more buildings and do more things. So right now, if I wanted to trade in my goods, again, if it's my turn, I would go ahead and open up what's called a trading house tile. And this tells you how much those goods are worth right now. So my brown coffee roaster would be worth two cards, and my one blue indigo plant would give me one card. So again, because it's my turn, the privilege on this card is I could actually sell two goods. Because it's not Phil's turn, he could sell a good but only one. So that's the whole key. You always have to look at your privilege. Whoever's turn it is, whoever has that governor card, gets the extra privilege or functionality of that action. So if I sold both of these goods, I'd put them in the discard pile, and I would actually take three cards, but I would put them in my hand. So I'd actually take three, and that's my payment, basically. And I can do more things now, build more buildings and mm -hmm. uh, do more fun things to uh, gain more uh, stuff. So Trader allows you to then sell your goods. Fourth card is pretty normalized here of uh, another reason why you don't draw your you know, hand up, because you can use the counselor to get more cards. Now, the way this works is you only get one card, but you actually can draw two cards and pick which one you want. Or, if it's your turn, the privilege is I can pick up five cards and pick the one that you want. So you get best of five as opposed right. to if it's not your turn. Because you might be looking for something specific or you might need a certain, maybe see some good victory points out there. Mm -hmm. um, you can make a decision on which card might make better sense for your hand. So the counselor, again, I can pick up to five cards because it's my turn and keep one. And then Phil can pick up two and keep one as well uh, during that round. The very last card is the prospector again allowing you to pick one card from the deck. 
but only the person whose turn it is can actually pick the one from the deck. The other person gets nothing. No nothing for you. Nope. No nothing. That's like a double. It's bad. That's bad. You don't get anything for that one. I don't get anything. Uh, so when you do the prospect, you're kind of going to the other person. I'm taking a card and you can't get one. So that's it. You're building your buildings. You're producing goods. You're trading goods to sell to get more cards. You're getting more cards and picking one out of two or one out of five, depending who you are. That's and right. then you're picking a card. So you're really just trying to, you know, wheel and deal. That's a better, right. better word. Now, that's your basic stuff. Now, however, there are some building cards that are not blue, white, tan, I would say that's tan, brown, or, or silver. I'm not sure <laughs> what that color is, but we could, I'll assume that. And that is actually a purple card. The purple cards, as you can see, you don't actually see them on the trading floor. You're not actually going to trade or sell goods out of them. But another example of a purple card might be this chapel card. Okay, now the chapel is a privilege. So if I look at the chapel, if I wanted to play it, I'd have to actually buy it with three cards. So if I want to place my chapel, I can take three cards out of my hand to pay for it. And now I've placed the chapel. So what the heck good is a chapel? The chapel allows me per round to take a card out of my hand and place it under the chapel. Mm -hmm. For each card I place under the chapel at the end of the game is another victory point in my, in my, my total. So that's actually a really cool card to have. But the thing is you have to remember to put the card under there, if you want, during the round. What is nice is the governor card actually reminds you of some of these things. As you take turns and you, you know, give the governor card to the next person, it reminds you to remember anybody who has a chapel to do that action, but also to make sure everybody has less than seven or less cards in their hand. You cannot have more than right. seven cards that's in your hand. hand Unless you have a special privilege that tells you you can, but That's normally true. it's a seven. And then, of course, you start your round. So that, that little card just reminds you uh, of the different rules there. There is something unique about these uh, purple cards as well, oh, yeah. or lavender, whatever color those are. Um, you can only have one of each type of card in your area. I can't right. build two trading posts. Or I can't build two chapels. I can't build two guild halls. I can right. only have one of those. Another thing about them is these don't, do not produce goods. I just so, yeah, I mentioned that they don't produce uh, any goods at all. Since they yeah. don't produce goods, you've got some strategy mm -hmm. there that if you only build those type of buildings, you're not going to be able to really get any cards unless you play the prospector accounts or those are the only cards you're going to get. So you really don't want to only build those buildings unless you really think you can win with the uh, total which is of the, the victory which is, points. Yeah, which is the purple. So um, that's a little bit different. The purple cards are a little bit mm -hmm. different, but they're definitely privileged. And they all have something different on them. Uh, there's different... Um, actions that you can take or, or privileges that you get from having those purple cards. Mm -hmm. Now, how does the game end? Or how do you know when you're done? <laughs> Whoever, whichever player has 12 buildings built, the minute they put that 12th building down, the game ends. And at that point, you total all your victory points. Yes. Uh, I can explain how that works. So they give you a pad in which you can total the victory points. Isn't it nice points. to have a scoring pad? I it like that. It is kind of nice to have so a scoring to pad. Take out a piece of paper. <laughs> so you basically just start from top to bottom. First you go through and all of the buildings that you've built, you add up the victory points on those yeah, buildings. Yeah, just to remind you again, I don't know if I said earlier, each of the buildings actually show the victory points at the bottom of the card. So this one, for example, has two victory points. Right, so we add yeah, those up, and uh, then we move down to the next row, which is the chapel. So whoever has a chapel, we total up the number of cards that they've put underneath that chapel. Each, they get a victory point for each. And just so remember, it's one per up. card. It doesn't matter what the victory points say on the cards. It's right. one per. Right. Uh, not to mention, you still got the two victory points for the chapel itself. Right. So, um, then there are a series of buildings that have a value of six. They, on this card, it says the six buildings. I have an example, the guild hall. Mm -hmm. So the guild hall... Uh, you, if you look at the bottom of the card, it says question mark victory points. So that obviously didn't get totaled at the beginning. It gets totaled now. Mm -hmm. You basically read what's on the card to figure out um, how many victory points you're going to get. So, for instance, the guild hall says at game end, owner earns two additional victory points for each of his production buildings. Right, not the purple ones, but the production right, buildings. Right, just the production buildings. But they're not all exactly That's the nice. same. That's nice. Another two points for each. Yes. So then we move down, we get a subtotal. Mm -hmm. um, after the subtotal, we the, the reason there's a subtotal is now you have if you have a palace. Here's the palace card. The palace says that you take that subtotal 
you divide it by four, you round mm -hmm. down. So in the case of somebody having 22, we round down, that equals five. That's mm -hmm. five more victory points um, that gets added to the score. A little bonus at the end if you have that palace. If you have the palace, yes. Mm -hmm. So you add up the sub subtotal and optionally the palace, and that and gives you the, you the total. total. And who won our game, Philip? Well, it was Jane 27, and I had 31. So I won the game. <laughs> he won the game. Yes. And I will beat him next time, for sure. But I did pretty good, though. 27 to 31. 27 to 31 is not yeah. a big difference. No, I'm it was good. Point it out. was good. It was, was pretty good. close. So. so we're going to review the game, but not here. We might drink while all of this is happening, but let's review the game from Sunny San Juan. Here we are at Raices Fountain in Old San Juan. Let me start by rating the first criteria of our game, which is, is it easy to learn? Yes, the game is easy to learn. In fact, it took under 10 minutes for us to learn and start playing the game. So, we gave it a four. Here we are at the old port of San Juan. Beautiful views, ocean breeze, absolutely gorgeous to look at. But we're here to review number two. How is the game manufactured? We thought the game manufacturing was a five. Absolutely spot on, definitely beautiful. The cards were wonderful, easy to shuffle, as well as the pieces were actually easy to punch out and work with. So we absolutely gave it a five, but it may not be as beautiful as this view of San Juan. Here we are in Parque de las Palomas, which is Pigeon Park, to rate the third criteria for our game, San Juan. The third criteria is, is the game fun to play? Definitely fun to play. It was very entertaining. We had a lot of fun playing it, so we gave it a five. Here we are in Old San Juan on Calle de Cristo. This is actually almost like a little Michigan Avenue down here in Old San Juan. You can see coach right behind me. But here we are to review our next criteria, which was the timing of the game. And we gave that a five. It took us less than one hour to learn and play in San Juan. And we love that, as you all know. So five for timing here on Calle de Cristo. Here we are at the Cathedral of San Juan to rate the fifth criteria, would we play this game again? We would definitely play this game again, so we gave it a five. Okay, we're back in the studio to get the final score for the San Juan game. And guess what? 20. Four. 24. That's a great 25. score. 25. It's not in production. <laughs> hey, Rio Grande, what's going on? But like I said, you can get copies online still, so no fear. You can definitely uh, still get it and play it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, what about this rum, though? Can't really screw up rum, can you? Can't really go wrong with rum. <laughs> no. And Puerto Rican rum, no mm -hmm. less. Mm -mm. Delicious. All right. So, until next time. Mm -hmm. Uh, make sure that you follow us on Twitter. Yes. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Oh, that's a chicken. That, Is that a chicken? Oh, no. I mind. guess they can tweet. Tweet. Uh, they can cluck. They can tweet. Uh, <laughs> so you tweet us on Twitter. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. Like, like our us, Facebook page. Like us on Facebook. Yeah. Also, please like this video. There's a little button for like or dislike. Well, you could dislike it if you want. We understand. Yeah. Um, and subscribe to our channel. You know, Please we, subscribe. We do notice that a lot of you are watching the show. We'll see a couple hundred views or whatever, hopefully more than yeah. that by the time this is taping. But the idea is that nobody's either liking or disliking. So we'd like to see more likes or dislikes just to see how you're feeling about the show. And please make comments if you want to as well. But until next time, we'll see you in two weeks. Happy gaming. Bye. Bye. for
number two show created by 